So a couple of weeks back, I made a video entitled How the Barefoot Industry Lies to You. And making that video, I knew that it was going to rustle some feathers. But what I didn't expect was to receive an email from the CEO of one of the major barefoot shoe companies asking to have a conversation with me about some of the points that I made in that video. He wanted to re-watch the video together and bring up a little bit of nuance and some rebuttal to some of the points that I made in that video. At times, it got a little bit heated. You talk it a lot. Know, my apologies. Just, let, just listen to Go me ahead. for a second. I think it's part of a discussion that really needs to be had about barefoot shoes, and we really got into the weeds on some of the most important topics, like when and how to barefoot run, how to transition safely, what to do if you're struggling with the transition. We talked about how the nervous system adapts or doesn't adapt. We talked about the use of mobility and stability work. And they also dropped some names of people who are leading the research and the practice of restoring foot function. So if you are looking to transition, if you are looking to improve the function of your foot and really understand a little bit more about barefoot shoes, how they work and how the industry works, then I think this is gonna be a really valuable conversation. It was a long conversation. I've cut it down as much as possible. The video quality isn't great because it was done on a Zoom call. So if you can put up with that, I think you'll hear a great conversation about barefoot shoes that I think really needs to be heard. So here it is, the chapters below will help you find and search for the information that you really need. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so Chase, first of all, um, pleasure to have you uh, do this with me. Um, as I mentioned to you in an email after I saw this video, I thought I had two choices. I could do a reaction video, which is kind of a classic thing, but then it just goes back and forth and back and forth and it's just kind of whiny. And so I thought it'd be much more fun to actually say hi, first of all, and then to do this in real time, because I think that would be more valuable for humans and um, so here we are. Any thoughts before we jump in and take a gander at your video? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's essential that we have a, a space for good conversations rather than just bickering in the comments section. So I was, uh, I was open to the invitation. <laughs> yeah, I think, that's, I, think that's a, I think that's a good rule for life in general is let's just have a real conversation and it's just, just bickering in the comment section. Um, so, uh, so good. So let's start with the simple thing. Um, so the title of this video, how the barefoot shoe industry lies to you, say a little, say a little something about that. <laughs> well, the idea of barefoot shoes came about mainly through Vibram, right? And that started with some, maybe some misunderstandings or maybe some misinformation. And so I'm using the word lie because it's, it's, it presses people's emotional buttons and it's going to get them to watch it. And at the end of the day, the information, if the information is useful, which I think it is, I think that's, that, that's an okay, you know, it's an okay risk, risk switch. Yeah. Risk to say. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's, it's clickbait and, and this is YouTube yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's, that's the reality of YouTube. Well, if so you want me, to watch your videos. Cool. So let me address two things really quickly. For people who don't know, I'm Stephen Sashin, CEO and co-founder of Zero Shoes. We've been doing this for 13 and a half years. So let me just start by saying I fundamentally agree with the number one point you're making, which is not everything is for everyone. But um, as one of the top sellers of minimalist footwear in the world, and having been doing this for a while, I've got some data, some opinions, um, and some things that could expand the conversation. And, and mm -hmm. again, um, you know, jumping in, you know, the first thing you admit, do you want to hit play and see where we go? As you basically admit, yeah, you know, this not? is about your personal story. As someone who's been wearing barefoot shoes for the last 10 years, as someone that in general promotes them, and I generally think they're a good idea, there are still some things that you need to know, which I want so to pause right there. in this video. So I'll tell you a fun story as you're getting to it. And the one right from, uh, yeah, that this one, one from, that I think one. it's from, is it from outside? No, it's from Vox. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, so it's from <laughs> Vox, which says something. Um, it and, does say something. And, 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 yeah, which means not what you think. And so, A, um, the most interesting thing about this is that this is actually complete bullshit. And I'll tell you why I say that. Because what this is talking about, the American legal system, was that Vibram, and we'll get more into this, got sued in a class action lawsuit for something that we're going to talk about. And the suit settled for $3.75 million. Compare that to the toning shoes with the idea that if you wear these shoes, they're going to make your butt look better. Those cases settled for hundreds of millions of dollars total. So this is 3.75 million versus hundreds of millions. Now I can tell you something, because the case settled, we don't know anything. We don't know, I mean, according to what in the public record, we know nothing about why it settled and what it meant that it settled, but I do. 
So I'll tell you some mm. things about this that you might find interesting. The first is the former CEO of Vibram USA, the guy who was running it when Five Fingers was actually catching on. He said, had he been still running Vibram, he would have never settled the lawsuit. Vibram as a company, they didn't really like the Five Fingers. They were in the business of making outsoles for shoes. And this shoe project came along and they thought it'd be a you know, goofy little thing. It was kind of a favor. Um, and then it just took off. And so, um, so he, the reason he said he wouldn't have settled the case and the reason that I think the case settled is because there actually was reasons to believe that the case would not, that the, the, the um, plaintiffs would not prevail. The people who were saying, here's why we're suing you, they wouldn't prevail. Now, I'm going to save that for a little later as we get into it, but this is the most interesting thing. I talked to someone who was the head of uh, marketing for a multi-billion dollar footwear brand. Right when the case settled, I happened to be talking to him, and I said, um, so I just have a hunch that you put out a press release about how Barefoot was bullshit before the before Vibram had a chance to put out a press release because you wanted to tell the story that Barefoot is bullshit. And so your media contacts got the story from you just like this before anyone else. And he said, yeah, of course that's what we did. Now, here's the even bigger irony about that. This is a company that was actually making shoes that they were calling Barefoot Shoes, and we'll get into that in a moment as well. But they were already, even though their sales were growing like crazy, selling minimalist footwear, they were already looking to pull out of that category because they couldn't tell two stories simultaneously, the barefoot shoe story and the padded shoe story. So even though they were making all this money on the barefoot stuff, riding the wave of interest that happened in 2009, 2010, um, they were backing out by 2012, even though their sales were going through the roof because they just didn't know what to do about it. So this is what people believed because this is what the big companies were saying, that it confirmed the barefoot shoes were bullshit, even though that's not what the case had anything to do with and it didn't prove anything. And like I said, I'll tell you in a moment what was really going on behind the scenes that um, calls all that into question. So anyway, uh, shall we continue or do you want to throw in your two cents? Yeah, right? no, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm loving this, this deep dive. <laughs> I just want to, um, <laughs> we're getting all the, all the industry secrets and I, I really appreciate it. No, let's, let's, uh, let's, yeah, let's keep going. I'll keep telling you when to stop going. Get ready to hit, get ready but to if, hit the pause. When, if you go, guys, if you go and find this article it's still up, go and read it. It is, it's really, uh, it's hyperbole, the whole thing. It's very entertaining. So I want to um, a choice really does govern your biomechanics and that can impact how you move through the world. Oh my God, pause right there. That was some guy running past me on the beach doing a, doing a really <laughs> heavy heel strike. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so let's actually be really clear here. In a way, your video and what I like to talk about has nothing to do with footwear. Even the fact that I'm running zero shoes, it's not about footwear, it's about form and function. It's about using your body in a way that's optimal or not, and if there are specific things you need to attend to, attending to those things. So for example, I'd like to say, look, let's not talk about you know, whether you should buy shoe number one, shoe number two, shoe number you know, A or B. Let's ask some questions. Is stronger better than weaker? Is being balanced better than being imbalanced? Is getting sensations so your brain knows how to move your body better than being numb? Um, is being mobile better than being immobile? And if your answer is yes, yeah, stronger is better than weaker, feeling is better than not feeling, mobile is better, posture is better, you know, then take a look at the products and see if they are encouraging or engendering what you just said is better or not. And I would argue that you know, a big padded shoe, and there's reasons we can get into, I don't want to dive into the whole thing about heels and whatnot, but there's reasons that big padded shoes, for example, lead to weakening, lead to um, joint issues, lead to all these various things. There's a lot of research on that, not important. But, um, but the point is, again, we can look at that later if we want, but the real point is this is about, natural, about the question of natural function given individual differences versus you know, a one-size-fits-all thing. And I think you, you actually do a good job of, of emphasizing that repeatedly, but also I think, you know, I think we'll see it kind of gets some of that conversation may get um, a little um, lost along the way. So, but anyway, that's a perfect image for uh, what we're talking about. So let's continue. <laughs> so let's go back to 2012 where Barefoot Shoes were quite literally all over the headlines. There was Pause. Chris McDougall's book, Born to Run. So actually, you know, Chris's book came out originally, I think 2008, but 2009 is when it got popular. And what happened <clears throat> in the initial days from 2000, end of 2009 or middle of 2009 through the middle of 2010 is the big shoe companies were saying, you know, the whole idea of Barefoot was getting some interest, even though Born to Run really had nothing to do with Barefoot Running. There was because the Tatarmara don't really run barefoot. Um, if, for people who don't know, the book is about the Tatarmara Indians 
who run incredibly long distances in sandals made from straps of tire strapped to their foot. And they're incredible runners. They run often pain-free, injury-free, totally enjoyably into their 60s, 70s, 80s. And they run huge amounts of miles. They won the Leadville 100, the highest trail ultra marathon uh, ever in uh, sandals. The second year they came back and ended up winning barefoot because the shoe sponsor that wanted to capitalize on them, they could, the Tatarmata couldn't wear their shoes, so they ripped them off and finished the race barefoot. By two, late 2010, oh, so in the middle of 2000, you know, like the middle of 2010, the big companies were saying, oh, you can't run barefoot. If you do, you're going to step on hypodermic needles. You'll get Ebola. Your kids won't get into college. Your car won't start. Your mortgage will go up. You won't remember the number three. I mean, it was just, you know, ludicrous. But by the end of 2010, they started making minimalist shoes. And I put air quotes around that because research from Irene Davis at Harvard showed that the shoes that the, those companies were making were actually the worst things you could possibly wear. And we might get into the, well, the why is simply that, again, this is about doing what your body would do naturally, which is that, here, I'll do it this way. If you're running barefoot, bad form hurts, good form can feel good. And if you have enough padding getting in between you and the ground, you're not getting the feedback that you need to know if you have bad form or good form. That's really the mm -hmm. gist of it. Um, and so they were making shoes that had too much padding. They were too narrow often. Um, one company, let's see, I won't mention them by name. Um, I'll say their name rhymes with narrow. They, um, <laughs> they, uh, yeah, you know, narrow. I don't know who they are. They would call me and say, hey, do you want to get a pair of our new shoes? I'd say, they don't fit me. They said, well, do you want a pair? I said, no, seriously, they're too narrow for my midfoot. I can't get them, and they have too much arch built into them. They said, well, do you want a pair? I said, dude, if you send me a pair, I'm going to sell them on eBay. They said, do you want them? I went, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> so I made, made a few hundred bucks that way. So, nice. so they were making these shoes. They were using all the language to capitalize on the interest, but the shoes were not actually providing the same benefits as, of course, going mm -hmm. barefoot. Whole other story. I'm not going to try and talk anyone into going barefoot. Um, uh, but as the shoes that were actually made specifically for barefoot running, even the Vibrams, the original shoe, the KSO, which stood for keep stuff out, that was a pretty fine shoe, really, really thin rubber held it, you know, stayed on your foot. When they made a shoe specifically running, they added a whole bunch of padding to it. So they basically mm. made it a regular shoe that just looked dorky. So right. um, that <laughs> confused the issue as well. So a quick inside story about that. So the guy who was the CEO, I met him in 2011, 2010, 2011. I'm not sure which. And I said, the first thing I said to him, because I'm like this, I said, you guys aren't doing enough for education because it's not about just putting on the shoes and away you go. It's about the form changes that can happen when you're getting the feedback from wearing something like this. And his response mm -hmm. was, I know it's out of control. It's like the thing took off before they had the ability to try to control the message or to even provide education. So, you know, there's a mis misunderstanding that it's like, oh, they were just claiming that all you have to do is wear these shoes and it goes fine. They never said that. But that was what was happening in retail is the retailers mm. were suggesting that because they didn't know any better. And that's what people had in their mind for reasons that I frankly can't explain. Um, so well, that's again, what people you know, want. Exactly. People, people so, want to be able to put a certain, buy a certain product and start wearing it and get immediate benefits that last well, forever and doesn't require them to do anything. And that doesn't well, exist. No, no, no. As but, far you know, as but ironically, but ironically, this is the story from a big shoe. This is what happens every time mm. some big shoe company comes out with some new magic technology. Sorry, magic technology is that they're mm -hmm. promising exactly that. All you have to do is wear these shoes. Your injuries will go away. You'll run faster. I mean, they promise that in a way that. In the minimalist world, none of us have ever done, ever. Yeah. You'll find if you look in the, in the, you know, the way we run, we run ads, there may be some small companies, but the biggest ones, I mean, I'm one of, I'm probably number two after Vivo Barefoot. Um, that's about to change. But regardless, you know, we never did that. And big shoe companies do it all the time, despite their own evidence. Like, dude, if you go to the Nike website, I, I have to find the page. We'll put it in the, in the notes. Um, they post the results of a study they did about three and a half years ago where they compared the Zoom Structure 22 to the React Infinity Run, a new shoe. I'm doing this for a reason. And it was a 12-week study, half marathon training program. And in the Zoom Structure 22, over 30% of the people wearing that shoe got injured. In the React Infinity Run, only a, just shy of 15% got injured. Now, check this out. The way they publicized it was new shoe reduces injury by 52%. <laughs> but 15% yeah. get injured and injury rates don't stay constant after 12 weeks. They go up progressively. So they basically proved 
what many of us have known for a long time, which is running injuries. Runners typically about 50 to 80 percent get injured every year. And Nike showed mm -hmm. that after 50 years of R&D and all their engineering and all their best efforts, they were still going to injure 50 to 80 percent of the people wearing their shoes. So they make claims, look, this shoe reduces injury. They don't show you the actual numbers. They get no flack for it at all. And yet mm. a misunderstanding about what's going on in the barefoot minimalist world, you know, gets uh, people all uh, panties in a wad. So Nike um, and a couple of other companies actually had done some studies looking at barefoot running and concluded that it was good, but that they couldn't make a shoe that was a barefoot style shoe. So there's it's common knowledge in the industry that here, I'll say it this way. We had a, a friend of ours who went to Harvard Business School, talked to friends of his who went to Harvard Business School, who are now working at some of the major footwear brands in the world and said, what do you think mm. about this natural movement idea? And every one of them had the same response. It's completely legit, but we can't do it because it would be, it would be admitting we've been lying for 50 years. Mm. They, they, this look, is the again, key. That, <laughs> yeah. But you, yeah, I, yeah. I see no reason why you can't backstep on this stuff. One of the things that you said earlier was like, um, there's no one shoe that is for everyone. And this is like part of that I agree with and part of it I don't. I think if we had kids from the age of whatever, from one, as soon as you're wearing shoes, if you're wearing barefoot minimal style shoes and you stay like that, you'll you have a lot less biomechanical problems. And I 100% agree with that. Sure, there might be some kids that, yes, there will be two, three, four percent that have biomechanical issues that will need Correct. a heel raise or more support or whatever because of um, uh, birth some, defects and, and whatnot. Issue. But everyone no. else will have a lot less injuries and a lot less biomechanical problems later on in life if they stay, if they start and remain in minimalist yeah. efforts. Um, Irene Davis said to me once, if we just got kids wearing shoes like yours, in 20 years we wouldn't be treating adults for the billions of dollars of problems they have with their feet, ankles, hips, mm. backs, legs. Etc. So yeah, totally yeah. agree. Um, if you want, I like to say, if you want to go to a place where they don't have the kind of foot, ankle, hip, back, whatever issues that we have, just find any place that doesn't have indoor plumbing. So you know, if they aren't wearing <laughs> shoes all the time, yeah. then they're not having these kind of problems. So anyway, well, I see. Let's... I've spent a fair bit of time in Asia, and yeah. you you see a lot of flat flat feet there, and yeah. they are barefoot a lot. So I mean, collapsed arches. Uh, well, flat, well, flat these, feet. These well, let's, well, let's be. Hold on. Let, let's be clear about two things you just said. So, flat feet doesn't necessarily mean a collapsed arch because arch height is predominantly genetic. Um, what can affect your arch is how strong they are, how well you're using them, but also just you know straight out genetics. So, like when people show examples of the feet of some Aboriginal tribe and they go, "Look what those are. That's what ours should be like." It's like, no, no, that's you know thousands of years of evolution as well, and ju as just people having kids with other people who had similar kind of feet. So let's not confuse the issue and pretend. Or when people say, look at a baby's foot. That's the shape that your foot should be. It's like, that's like saying, look at a baby's head. That's the, high, the, the size your head should be in relation to your body. <laughs> like, don't be ridiculous. Things change. But the other thing is overpronation. So let's be clear about this one. Um, there's, a, there's a footwear guy named, oh, I always forget his name. Um, come on, Simon Barthold. Simon used to be like Mr. Anti-pronation until he started getting into all the research. And he's like a big deal researcher. And now he does not think pronation is a problem because there is no evidence that pronation inherently causes problems. Now, and so overpronation isn't even actually a term that they use in the medical community. Hyperpronation is, which is simply that you're pronating so quickly, you're, you don't have the strength or the feedback to adjust and accommodate that. But, um, mm. but pronation, if you look at some professional runners, when they pronate, which basically means as your foot's coming down, your ankle bone is kind of you know coming down as well. It's the simplest way of putting it. There's some there's some marathoners, world champion marathoners, whose ankle bone practically hits the ground when their foot does. Does not prevent them from running you know a marathon in slightly over two hours. So there's a mm. lot of misconception about pronation, um, but there's zero evidence that it's fundamentally a problem. There's a lot of evidence that people will sell you on the idea that it's a problem and then try to make you buy a seeming solution. And that solution, typically an orthotic, doesn't really work either. But that's a whole other story. We can we'll we'll get into that mm. another time, maybe. So anyway, moving on. Okay. Well, I think this is about like if you're adding something to the shoe, that can be useful yeah. for a short amount of time to to reteach the nervous system how to adopt a new position. And uh, then if you can ma maintain that, then you can yeah, then you can continue to use that. 
possibly. There's a tool called Barefoot Science. That's the whole idea where it's not really an orthotic, but it is. that's the whole premise is that it's giving you some sort of feedback to retrain your gait pattern. Um, I've been experimenting with it. I can't tell that it is or isn't doing it at the moment, to be totally candid. But, um, mm. uh, but I also started out in a different situation. I started out playing with that after 13 years of running around barefoot and building strength, which um, affected my arch in a positive way. Mm. And so, mm. um, so it's a bit tricky. But, um, uh, but yes, anyway, on we go. At the time, as you may remember, it was one of the key players in the barefoot shoe industry and that was Vibram Five Fingers. This company got into quite a little bit of hot water with some of the claims that they were making that people could benefit simply from wearing the shoes alone. And some people called bullshit on this. In fact, 150,000 people joined a class action lawsuit against Vibram Five Fingers, and the result of that was that the company had to pay back $3.75 million and also had so, to retract yeah. their statements. So, pause right there, this is perfect. Okay, so, 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 we're gonna get into this a little bit more, I think, I can't remember where you do it in the video. So, um, we can wait for this, but let's be clear that the difference between making a statement that's a lie, a statement that's false, is different than, legally, a false claim. And I'll mm. may as well jump into it now. A false claim is simply something you don't have substantiation for, you don't have a piece of research behind it. So, we don't make claims about what we're doing or about the benefits of what you know, Zero Shoes can do. We have mm. tens and tens of thousands of people uh, who are leaving reviews talking about the benefits they've received, but we don't advertise those. We don't publicize those because we don't have a specific medical study using our shoes. And this is the important part because there are many studies that back up some of the things we could talk about. But if we don't have a study on, for that particular thing using our shoes, we won't make that claim simply because the footwear industry is, a, is crazily competitive. And um, we're you know, making big, big headway and we're making, getting a lot of attention from big shoe companies, some of whom are anxious about us, some of whom have already tried to hurt our business. So we just don't want to give them any ammunition. We have times our customers happiness team will sometimes say, it sounds like someone's trying to get us to admit something like we cure plantar fasciitis because they want to have that on <laughs> tape so they can use it against us. They're really good at making sure that they don't make any claim that we can't substantiate with an actual medical study using our shoes. But we'll get to the specifics of that in a minute. Yeah, I think um, for me, what, what I've learned in the time that I've been wearing barefoot shoes is that it's a window that opens up like a story that your body is telling you. And if you are wearing a padded shoe, then you're not going to be able to listen to that story. It's, all, or it's going to be deafened. It. Yeah, and so that's a great analogy. Actually interacting with the ground and feeling what's happening. Okay, there's tightness in my calves. There's tightness in my, my psoas or hip flexors. Um, like a janky shoulder. That can be related to how, how, how our gait patterns and how we breathe. Absolutely. Like it's all one system that's interacting. And you are just deafening it by, by putting a really heavy, thick structured shoe on that. And I think that's the story yeah. that all barefoot shoes should be telling you. There should be what I'm saying you know with these lies is that okay well then maybe then maybe they're not lying but they're certainly not telling the full story well, well let me pause there that people have to go through so let me pause there who's the they in that equation so again speaking as one of the top two sellers we don't do mm. what you just said so who is because i'm not i haven't i haven't seen anyone who's saying hey just wear these and everything's gonna be great um mm. so i don't so and what, what you just said is something I say all the time. I go, look, there's a reason you have 200,000 nerve endings in the soles of your feet. It's to get feedback from the ground so your brain knows how to move your body. How much can you feel through something that's this thick and, this, and super stiff? The answer is nothing. So I, I, I love that you brought that up because that's exactly the, one of the messages that I say over and over and over, and it's all over our website. But for the people, but I don't, do you know what a straw man argument is? Yeah. Okay, for anyone who doesn't, straw man argument, you make up a fake person, then you argue with that fake person as if that fake person is the person you really want to argue with. That's the gist of it. Yeah. So my question is to you, and I, I'm literally asking because I haven't seen, like, think of the other, the biggest company, Vivo Barefoot, you know, Vivo and us. We don't do that. We don't say, at least I haven't seen them say, you know, just put these on, everything's going to be great. So have you actually seen that somewhere, or is that a straw man argument? No, no, no. I mean, I, I don't think that's, uh, it wouldn't make sense for any company to say, buy these shoes and you'll probably be in more pain in the next few months. So I'm not <laughs> suggesting you say that. <laughs> no, no, no. But, 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 uh, but let me pause there too. 
But let me pause there mm -hmm. because the idea that if you just switch to a minimal shoe, you're going to be in pain for a few months. Also, not borne out. I mean, there's certainly no research proving that. And not borne out mm -hmm. by the experience of, you know, our over a million customers. I do have an interesting article or a couple of articles um, on our website. One is called Calf Pain is Optional. And so, and then I also have a thing about if you're getting uh, any sort of blisters or abrasion, how that's telling you about form. Like your point before about feel, the importance of feeling the ground is my wife says at best is our shoes are at best a coach. They're, you know, there's mm -hmm. enough, there's so little between you and the ground that they're giving you that feedback that you can use to make those adjustments and get out that janky shoulder or play with, you know, whatever's happening in your hamstring or your hip flexor or whatever. But, um, uh, there was a point that I was saying about that. Um, so, but again, I'm not. But there, the whole idea that you're going to be in pain is, I would argue, not borne out, certainly not borne out by research and not by the experience that I've seen most of the time. And you also have to def be we have to be careful about what we're calling pain or an injury. So there have been mm -hmm. some, some research where what they call an injury is something like someone just reported, hey, something feels painful, versus like that Nike study where an injury was something that kept you from running for at least three sessions, which is at least a week. Mm -hmm. That's a very different thing. And many of the studies that came out don't really define injury well or they misrepresent it. And just having a little bit of pain, um, like maybe a little calf soreness, it's, you know, I, the biggest thing we like to say is just you don't want to do too much too soon. You don't go to the gym if you haven't been mm -hmm. to the gym for a while and do eight hours of bicep curls. You know, you do a little bit, you see how you feel the next day. When you feel good, you add a little more. And we say that mm -hmm. all over the place. Um, but even then, it, you know, the problem is you don't know if you did too much too soon unless you do too much too soon. But we yeah. do everything we can to try to keep people, you know, from, from doing too much. The problem for some people is that it feels so much fun to not have your toes squeezed together, to feel the ground, to do all those things that they just have, you know, they're having a blast and they get slowly tired during the course of a run or a course of a couple of days. And then, you know, they're using their muscles more than they need to. Like the biggest instruction I like to give is you need to relax more, not get strong, not do more. You need to do less yeah, more yeah, often yeah. than not. So, yeah, that's a big lesson that I've learned in the last couple of years, like trying to look for more activation in the body. Like where's the weakness, find this, like crank the crank, everything really tight. And, and then I end up being like this big ball of tension walking around because I'm like my <laughs> yeah. nervous system is trying to activate all the muscles all the time, you know? And I yeah. think do less, um, do less. If we can, if we can educate people or even educate ourselves first and then be able to articulate um, our experience of being as relaxed as possible while we're walking, while we're hiking, using our natural yeah. slings in our body and using the natural elasticity that our bodies have and gravity to push us forward rather than yeah. just like trying to get all the muscles to be super active, then we're going to have a much better time. In a related note, for the fun of it, I was just walking up a steep hill with some people during lunch and I found a funny way to walk. Again, we don't need to deal with this now. That's just swinging your, you know, rotating your hips and barely using your mm -hmm. legs. And just by rotating your hips and stretching your hip flexors and letting them naturally recoil, you can kind of walk up a hill almost effortlessly. You're not using your, your leg almost at mm -hmm. all. It's really, it's really cool. You look like a complete idiot, but it's really, it's really <laughs> cool. <laughs> so, all right. Anyway, yeah. let's. No, but that going. ties into oh, yeah. that's what you're describing is, you know, the sling that the between your hips and your shoulders. So if you're putting yeah. more rotation into your torso, there's a counter effect to that. And that's right. Yeah. yeah. Now I recently just dove into the court documents here to make sure I've got my facts straight oh, great. and looking okay. at some of these claims, I don't blame them because this is actually pretty wild. So in some of their marketing material, you can see there was claims like this, five reasons to wear or train in Vibram five fingers. So this was something that was okay. displayed so in here. stores that were selling. So the number one thing that was, um, that was actually part of the lawsuit was number one, strengthens muscles to feet your lower legs. Now this is why I think the case settled for pennies on the dollar. There was a study way before Vibram on the Nike Free from uh, Peter Brueggemann showing that walking in the Nike Free or wearing the Nike Free actually strengthened muscles in the feet and lower legs because you're using them more. This is really, you know, this could not be more obvious. If you want to get stronger, if you want your bicep to get stronger, you don't put it in a cast, which makes it not move. You go out and do bicep curls. So if you're not letting your foot move, then it not only does it make sense that it gets weaker, but research that came out after this <clears throat> has proven that's the case. Um, Christina Protopropos, put arch support in the shoes of healthy individuals. Within 12 weeks, they had lost up to 17% of the muscle mass in their feet and ankles. So th this one's kind of like, it makes sense using your feet 
would actually help build strength. Uh, not using them would make them weaker. And in fact, the only reason that, that Vibram didn't have the proof of this one <clears throat> is when Harvard's Daniel Lieberman was doing research on the five fingers, uh, the guys from Vibram said, should we study foot strengthening? And Dan said, why bother? Brueggemann already proved it. And of course, you know, if you can use your feet, they can get stronger. So they didn't spend the extra money. Oops. And it led to this. So that one's part one. Part two, the one that you highlight in a minute, improving the range of ankle in, uh, range of motion in ankles, feet, and toes. So feet and toes kind of makes sense. Again, if you have a shoe that lets your foot bend and flex, you know, naturally, you would think that that could be good for range of motion. Um, ankles, who knows? There's definitely not a study on that one. Um, hmm. Stimulating neural function, again, if you have something where you can feel the ground, it seems to make sense. That's actually stimulating your feet. That, and that is about balance and agility. Eliminates heel lift to hmm. align the spine and improve posture. So the way I would say that, um, if we're going to be marketing-ish, is that we're just not elevating your heel, which messes with your posture. We're, you know, we're mm. having a flat shoe to allow for proper posture. What your body's gonna do, and if there's no evidence for that, that's, uh, if there's not studies showing that, that's one thing. Again, you know, there's a, it's really funny. People like to dismiss anecdotal information. They go, well, people are saying that. And if it's only one person saying it, it's one thing. But you have tens of thousands of people spontaneously saying the same thing. It's a good data point. You know, at least it's worth some, something to look at. And, um, but again, just think about it logically. You elevate your heel, that... Yeah, more, more weight on the foot. forefoot. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, so it seems obvious that that one should be the case. Allows the foot and body to move naturally, which just feels good. Um, so, yeah, you know, that one's not a scientific claim. So that's, yeah. you know, that's, just, that's just marketing. But again, but the key thing here is to remember that the difference between making a claim that isn't true and making a claim that isn't supported, that's a false claim according to the law, those are two mm. different things. So if we conflate those, it sounds like they were lying, but if we understand the difference, it's simply they didn't have something to back up that claim. But if we think about some of this, A, if we think about some of this stuff from a common sense perspective, it makes sense, and B, sat, and there was research showing this prior to Vibram, and of course since then, in the last, whatever that is, 13 years or 12 years, there's been tons of research showing, I think other than the range of motion and ankles, showing every one of these. Hmm. Yeah, it's a shame that that, that research timing. came about from Harvard. Timing. Well, you know, look, mm. in the early days, the research wasn't happening because who's going to sponsor it? The big companies aren't going to sponsor it to see if, you know, maybe they're wrong. And we didn't mm. have the kind of money. I mean, my God, you know, when this was happening, what we had made, you know, I mean, like enough money to make a car payment. So um, yeah. it wasn't, it, the, the companies that would benefit from that kind of research the most didn't have the money to put on that, do that kind of research. And it will probably be that way for quite a while. <laughs> uh, it is. There's more coming out. There's some research being done now on minimalist footwear and balance in the elderly, on plantar fasciitis, mm -hmm. more stuff on foot strength. Um, I mean, there's, there's actually a lot happening now, which uh, we're really, really excited about. Yeah, that's good because, I mean, fall prevention or like falls kill uh, you know, my grandma died a couple of months ago because she fell and broke her hip and then the complications yeah. from that my, my dad, okay. uh, seven years ago, same thing, same thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All righty. Let's keep going. For the five. Okay. And five and fingers. So it's clear that more and more consumers are again, coming around to the idea of wearing a more natural barefoot minimal style shoe, but this presents huge problems for many really? of those huge. people. Actually. Yeah. The huge problems is an interesting one because this mm. is sort of like when people were saying, oh, you know, um, barefoot shoes are you know, more people are getting injured. It's like, no, 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 there were people who were trying something. Um, I never met a doctor who actually looked at someone's form. They always said, hey, I'm getting more patients. Like, well, yeah, but that happened in 1972 when running shoes were invented as well. So when more people were mm -hmm. trying something, there's going to be more issues. But no one ever compared, or at least that I didn't see, um, in a well-designed study, the like real injuries for people who are running in barefoot shoes versus regular shoes. We already know, again, 50 to 80% of runners get injured in regular shoes. What's happening comparatively is the question. Not are someone, is someone trying, who's trying something new having a problem, but if they're trying something new, what are they doing? How are they doing it? How well are they doing it? I mean, there's just so many factors that were being overlooked in, the conver in, in a hyper-simplified conversation that, again, was in many ways dictated not only by what big shoe companies wanted you to think, because they were terrified that people were going to never buy another pair of shoes, but also just you know what we've been led to believe for 50 years 
that you need padding, you need our support, you need motion control, you need all these things, despite the fact that there's literally zero evidence that those things provide the benefits that are claimed, let alone any benefit or possibly any benefits at all. So, hmm. yeah, I guess my, my major, uh, my major gripe with barefoot shoe industry and the idea of barefoot shoes, even though I love them, even though I wear them all the time, is that the answer is always more time. More time again, in barefoot shoes, but, 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 but your body but will wait, adjust. Wait, wait, wait. Hang on. Just yeah, let okay, me finish ahead. for a second. Sorry. You're sorry, talking sorry. a lot. You're talking a I lot. My apologies. Just, let, just listen to go me ahead. for a second. Time is not always going to be the answer. You could spend decades in barefoot shoes, and it's not necessarily going to fix the problem just by walking around in barefoot shoes. There's going to be biomechanical problems that will arise that need attention in terms of <clears throat> strength training. The nervous system is going to have to respond and you're going to have to reteach the body to adapt to a new pattern. And unless you do that, you will continue to be in pain. And, the, and, the, and this is the big problem. This is the big idea or the big lie that keeps being pushed forward is that it's just more time, more time, give it more time. But here's my question. It's not going to who, happen. Who is saying that? I don't say it. Vivo doesn't say it. Vibram doesn't say it. So this is, again, the straw man thing. I don't know who the they is in that sense. But none of us who are the top sellers in the industry have ever said that. That's the answer that is permeated in, in this conversation, that it's but, more time. But, than, you're, but what you're fit. saying, but to be clear, what you're saying is the barefoot shoe industry is saying this. And I'm saying who, because those of us who are the number one sellers in the barefoot shoe industry have never said that. Now, what we said, to be clear, what we have said is you're right. I agree with you on many of the points you've made that it is about retraining your gait. It is about your nervous system. And in fact, I talk about that extensively about, in fact, I have my undergraduate research was in cognitive aspects of bio, biomechanic, oh, but cognitive aspects of motor skill acquisition. So I have a whole neurological structure that I talk about for the different kinds of people neurologically and what they may need to do differently in order to make a transition. I've never said it's just about time and that will cure all ills. And I don't know anyone else who has. If they are, they should be called out. But to say the industry is doing that is including people like me who have never said that. And as the number one or number two, number one in America and number two in the world seller of minimalist shoes, that's where I say it's a straw man argument because you're saying, you're, you're making the comment that the industry is saying that. And those of us who are the industry, I don't know anyone who's ever said that. Hmm. I can appreciate the way that you feel for sure. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that when I, when I say industry, it's more just what what do people what are most people understanding from the conversations that are happening about barefoot shoes but that's yeah different. but i'm i mean to say to say that people have a misunderstanding is one thing to say that the burden that the problem is because we've been set making a claim that hasn't been made that's a different story yeah okay i, I agree with that yeah. and i think like this comes back to the first thing we talked about, which is this video is designed to to get to educate people and to tell a story and to, to have a to be entertaining, right? And yeah, I'm just yeah, part, I'm trying to be part of this conversation, and I'm trying to bring a little bit more nuance and a bit of like a deeper understanding to uh, to something that I think is really important. And I think agreed on the whole. I think uh, I think like I said earlier, kids should be wearing barefoot shoes for sure. But I agreed. think there is there is this general understanding that people people will read the comment section and they'll read the the positive stories and maybe yeah. they'll read the negative stories and then they'll try something and for sure that they will almost certainly uh, try and adapt too, too quickly. But I think the, my main problem, I guess, is that there is a lot that we don't know and there is, it's like almost what? like barefoot shoes, well, we don't know why certain individuals will adapt and have a great experience where whereas others won't okay Enlightened. i would argue that I, I would argue that i do okay Here, I'll, give, I'll give it to you, i'll give it to you in a nutshell so if um uh, uh well there are a couple things let's just use a, a macro level one to begin with a the people that we already talked about who've been told or who come to believe for reasons that i don't understand frankly that all they need to do is switch and they can go and away they go. That's going to be a problem no matter what. Um, there, are, um, there are people who believe 
that no pain, no gain, that you have to have pain in order to progress. Also not true and not something that we have ever said. Um, and no one that I know in the industry has ever said. But then, but in terms of the success in adopting, if they are paying attention, if they are not trying to go out and do too much, if they are whatever, um, here's, here's my neurological explanation. And there's no scientific backing for this. This is just from my research from you know, 30 something years ago and what I've noticed. So if I gave you instructions on how to run barefoot, I would say pick a nice smooth, hard surface. It's going to give you the most feedback. There won't be anything hiding in the way, like in the grass. Um, go for a short run, 20 seconds. And wait and see how you feel the next day. If something feels sore, like you just did too much, a little muscular sore, like you went to the gym and did too many set, too many reps, rest, do a little less. And when you can do whatever that number, that amount is, and you feel fine the next day and the day after, add 10 seconds, and then just keep adding 10 seconds, you know, until you're running at an amount of time that you care to. Take your time. If you feel like you've done too much, then pull back. I mean, again, you're your own coach. Now, if you feel like you've hurt something, that's a different story. And then you definitely want to make sure that you're getting some cues on what proper form is, because it's not about barefoot or shoes. It's about proper form, arguably. And what I would say is, you know, the number one thing is get your feet underneath you instead of over striding and heel striking. If you're, don't, many people think, the first time I saw someone who told me they were told they had to land on their toes and they overstrided and then pointed their toes, it's like, oh God, don't do that. So they're landing with their foot way in front of their body and then pointing their toes. That's a stress mm -hmm. fracture waiting to happen. But no one ever said, just point your toes and prance. It's like, if you land with your foot underneath you, you can't help but land midfoot or forefoot because just the way your body's made. But... So that's the basic instruction. Essentially, short run, hard surface. Do, if, in, if you're not having fun, do something different until you are, is the way I like to say it. And like really, really mm -hmm. short. Now, here's the thing. Some people, neurologically, and there's a whole thing about this in a book called The Brain That Changes Itself, about how your brain map de-differentiates so it doesn't, doesn't work properly. If you've been keeping your feet from feeling and you're not getting sensations from your brain to your brain from your feet, your brain literally goes, oh, you're not going to pay attention to that? Then I won't either. And it literally changes neurologically. So those people um, that, you know, if it hurts, do something different until you're having fun, they can't tell if it hurts. They literally can't feel. I've seen people do this. They go for a barefoot run on the grass or wherever. They come back with their feet all scraped up, and they don't even know that they've done that. So that's problem number one. Those people need to reawaken the neural circuits by just, like, walking on mildly unpleasant surfaces, whether it's sand or some little rocks or, you know, just even on your sidewalk. They've got to reawaken the natural neurological connections. The second group of people, they, have, they can tell if it hurts or not, but they have bad proprioceptive skills. And proprioception is not feeling the ground, it's feeling where your body is in space. And the way you can, you know, like as a former gymnast, uh, we had to learn to put our arms parallel to the ground, which we'd all look and go, but that's pointing down because from your eyes perspective, it's down, but it's actually parallel to the ground. Mm -hmm. So I, see, I hear people who say, who tell me they're not overstriding and heel striking. And then we look at it on video, and they're overstriding and heel striking. So many people don't have great awareness of where their body is in space and what it's doing. And so for them, video feedback is actually really important to start to get the feeling that what they're doing and what they think they're doing are different things. And the third, so that's the second group of people. They just need more feedback to get the ball rolling. The third group of people, they're, they, got, they can feel. They've got decent proprioceptive skills. They just need some cues to speed up the learning process, things like, Land with your feet underneath you. Or weird cues, like if you watch the old Flintstones, car Flintstones cartoons, pretend you're Fred, Fred Flintstone starting his car, and his feet are like behind him, and they never catch up. You can't actually run mm. with your feet behind you. It's just a cue to keep you from overstriding. Or sometimes I'll say do the opposite. Overstride as hard as you can. Reach way out so you can feel what wrong actually feels like, because you've gotten habituated to a particular pattern. You need to dehabituate. So you do that by either mm. trying something very new or ex exaggerating the thing you're doing badly. Those are two ways to kind of wake your brain up and learn a new neural, neural pattern. Um, the fourth group of people, and I will confess I was one of the, the fourth group, we're just good at learning new, new movement patterns. We're just really good at it. The problem that we have is it's so much fun, we do too much too soon. So my first barefoot run was like 45 minutes. Now keep in mind, I'm a sprinter. I had never run more than a minute in my life. And then I do 45 minutes, and I ended up with a big blister on the ball of my left foot that I never felt until like 20 minutes after I was done running because I was having such a good time. My form degraded. I got tired. I wasn't feeling it, and there it goes. Now, the good news is my right foot was fine, and I was thinking, huh, hmm. 
what did my right foot do correctly that my left foot did wrong? And on my second barefoot run, I just paid attention to my right foot and my left leg figured it out and got, you know, in alignment, which is, there's a bodywork technique called Feldenkrais. And that's the principle behind it is start with the good side, make sure your brain understands how the good side is working. And then the quote bad side has an easier way of adopting that same neural pattern. So I, now there isn't a good self test or frankly, even like an MRI to identify which of those four categories you're in. But from what I can tell, those are the distinctions that allow someone to make the transition in, in a different pattern, let's say, or with different requirements. Um, but it's all fundamentally leading to the same thing, which is uh, getting the right cadence, the right number of steps per minute. It's not a magic number. It's not like 180 is a magic number. It's just that if your cadence is slightly faster than what most people run, the amount of force you're putting into the ground is slightly less until you get to sprinting where you're putting more force in the ground. Um, and so it's the right cadence with your foot landing as close to your center of mass as possible um, with the right amount of, I don't want to say tension, the right amount of, what's the word I'm looking for? You want to be a tight spring. You don't want to be loose in your abdomen, for example. Um, you mm -hmm. also just want to be you know, getting the right amount of using your knees, your ankles, your feet as shock absorbers and springs versus you know, too little or too much. You don't want to be too stiff. You don't want to be too tight or too loose. But that's a matter of feeling it out. And of course, all this changes if you're accelerating, decelerating, going uphill, downhill, fast or slow. But the, but the key thing is it's about form, not footwear. And I would argue that those neurological types indicate some difference in the ability or the speed with which you can um, get the mm, awareness to make those form changes. And again, there's the other part, which is, is simply that if you're doing something that hurts a little bit, and you kind of, and you have some awareness while you're putting yourself through that, your brain will tr often try to find a way to let you keep doing that thing that you seem committed to doing without hurting. So that's what happened for me on that second barefoot run. It was just like, you know, I had a gaping hole in the ball of my left foot. I'm thinking if I can run in a way that doesn't hurt, I'm probably not doing the form thing that caused that problem. And nine minutes and 30 seconds of agony later, suddenly it changed. And I stopped overstriding and pointing my toes. I stopped pulling the ground underneath me. And everything you know, was instantly better. Now, again, I'm a freak because once I felt that one time, it stuck with me. So I'm not mm. I would never suggest it's like that for other people. Again, this is, I mean, I've taught everything from gymnastics to Zen archery to yoga to Tai Chi to tap dancing to whatever. I'm just good at movement patterns. Um, so I would never suggest that anyone else is like that because I've dealt with way too many people. But my, that's my, con I, would, I would contend that, that that kind of delineation or something like that is probably a determinant for uh, how somebody would transition safely from whatever they're mm -hmm. doing to, because look, the way you learn any new movement pattern is you do it slowly and a little bit at a time and you rest because that's when your brain integrates the new patterns and then you repeat that, you know, those little doses. The frust what we call frustration is actually the feeling of laying, trying to lay down a new neural pathway. So you want to have just a little bit of frustration because that's telling you you're doing something different, but then you want to rest and then see what happens the next time you go out. I mean, just the other day, you know, that, the whole thing of like a mild bit of frustration from just trying to do something new is actually the experience of laying down a new neural pathway. And if you don't push mm -hmm. it too hard, that's a good thing because then in the rest period, that's when your brain integrates that new, new pathway a little bit and you get a little better. I mean, it's funny that we get better after we couldn't do it right. We get better after we rest for a little while. And I had that happen to me on the track the other day, trying a new sprinting drill. I couldn't figure it out for the first 20 minutes. Then an hour later, I tried it again and I had it. Um, but it's not like it was really complicated. So that's not you know, patting myself on the back, not a big deal. But, um, but we forget that the way we learn is in small doses, over time. And that's the other thing that's lost, which is why, again, 20 second run, rest and see how you feel, try again. This is what I've been saying for 13 years, that exact method of, of and it's what Chris McDougall says also in, in, Born to, or in Born to Run 2, the new book. So this is all like great information. And it's, it's information that people need. Uh, but. And it's, it seems like, you know, you have a, an athletic background and that your body is adopted certain things but the, the reality is not everyone's like you a lot of people have they're stuck in not a sympathetic nervous system all the time Every, anything new is perceived as a as a threat 
and that, that that does create problems and i think um, like what i'm saying with with huge when i say huge problems right let's yeah. let's unpack this a little bit sure um if you're because i'm a hiker and i love hiking and hiking is a huge part of my life if you have a, a, a foot problem as a hiker that's yeah. now an identity problem because you can't do the thing that literally makes you who you are if you have a foot problem or if you have a foot injury as a hiker that's all of a sudden a very very big problem and yeah. i i talk to a lot of hikers on a daily basis about about their feet and about the problems they're experiencing <coughs> and i'm i'm not in a position to be able to say just wear barefoot shoes and everything will magically align because but again nobody uh, but nobody nobody with any integrity would say that and i would argue this is the argument that i'm making is that no one in the barefoot shoe industry says that there probably could be a little bit more education let's say that the industry has been going on for 13 15 years maybe a little bit 13. longer i don't know yeah you, you tell me and there's still a whole lot that we that we don't understand about why some people adapt and and why others don't and whilst a lot can be learned from one person just buying the shoes and experimenting, there is also many people who have gone through these experiences and not had such a great experience. And I think we need to be a little bit more realistic about the new How many is many? How many is many? And on a percentage basis, I'm, I'm just asking, because again, we have to be, I want to be clear about I don't want to be hyperbolic about it. There are undeniably some people who've had um, difficult times make, and maybe didn't make the transition. Here's, here's a variation on that. I've talked to people who said, I tried barefoot running and it didn't work for me. And I've asked, oh, did you actually like run barefoot? And they go, oh, no, no, no. I was in the Kinvara or the Merrill Trail Club or some shoe that Irene Davis calls partial minimalist that aren't going to mm -hmm. give you the same benefits. So there's a bunch of confusion undeniably. But again, I, I want to be careful about how we use language and how we're describing what's happening. If we don't have research behind it, to say that many people have had a problem, if we don't have research that backs that up, I don't want to jump on, I don't want to either say it's true or it's not true. I want to say, let's take a look and see. I can tell you from 13 years and over a million people that I'm not hearing many people are having a problem. You know, we got what, like 60,000 five-star reviews 60,000 out of, you know, a million is not a huge number, 6%, but, um, but regardless, it, it's, okay. I, I, well, I would argue, uh, just yourself, we've got to be Let's equally careful. One. Let's, for the fun of it, say 10%, ha, don't yeah. have a bad time. How does that compare to 50% of runners and 80% of marathoners who get injured every year? People have biomechanical problems no matter, no matter what, that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. well, and no, I, what I'm, say, what I'm saying that. is, what I'm saying is we can't isolate the barefoot world and hold that to a higher standard than we do to the regular mm. shoe world. That's a false. That's a false dichotomy, and that's yeah. the, that's the th that's fundamentally one of my arguments with your video is that in subtle ways that's what's happening because this is what a lot of people do. It's like, hey, there's a problem over here, but we need to compare it to the real, you know, to the rest of the world and see is it really a bigger problem or is it a problem at all? And again, to your point, I completely agree. The education is critical. And we are doing as much as we can to do that. I mean, I've only made like 500 videos and so, and done, <laughs> and done about 400 hours of podcasts about this. Um, I'm trying to do more, I promise. But, um, mm. but, and admittedly, many of the other companies are not that um, diligent about doing it because they, I mean, look, I'm, I, I'm, I like doing this and I'm good at doing this. So, so that's a different thing than someone who doesn't, you know, can't find someone to get on camera or talk well talk well, whatever I'm doing. Um, so, so I agree with you. Education is critical. Doing more research is critical. Identifying these things is critical. And we have to put it in the context of the rest of the world, where again, mm -hmm. when Nike proves that after 50 years, the best they can do is injure 15% of the people in their best shoe in under 12 weeks, that's the standard we have to hold ourselves to. Are we better than that? And I would say, Again, I don't have the research. I just have anecdotal information. I would say undeniably better. And so mm. I could be proven wrong. And if I am, I'm the first one to jump on and go, here's what we learned. And now let's deal with it. I'm more interested in reality than anything else. And that's why, again, my arguments are about straw man arguments. 
or about um, taking this out of context. Like, look, uh, you know, one of the last little bits for you in a way, when you talk about your experience, and by the way, about you know, having, having um, uh, with higher arches and what's necessary there, um, on our website, I explicitly have a page about flat feet and high arches where I even talk about how if you have higher arches, you need to work on mobility. It's not just wearing barefoot shoes. You're already hypertonic. You're already too much stress. So, you know, yeah. so we do the Hang best on. we can. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. So if you're hypertonic, if yeah. you're hypertonic, that's a nervous system thing. So you can do all the mobility Correct. you want. It's not going to change anything. Uh, it, depend, it depends on your perspective on how you deal with Look, this is my favorite topic, actually. So I agree. So um, whatever, well, actually... It's, it's, it's a little more complicated than some people think. So it's your nervous system, but not necessarily in ways that people understand. So for example, the way a muscle contracts is with the muscle spindle fiber, little part within your muscle fibers, that sends an electrical signal that makes your muscle contract. And it's possible for that muscle spindle fiber to be in a neurological loop where it's continually being stimulated and thinks that it should stay that way. And your brain can get basically numb to knowing that's happening. So it's not paying attention to doing that. So I mentioned Feldenkrais work before, not the only way of doing this, but the whole idea with the Feldenkrais modality is basically reminding your brain how your body could work and then uh, trying to unwind some of these, some of these um, uh, um, feedback loops that our brain and muscles can get stuck in. By the way, I mean, just as an aside, like as a former gymnast, I had a shoulder that was all out of whack. And um, I went to a Feldenkrais practitioner, in fact, the guy who brought it to America. And by doing this one weird movement pattern, out of nowhere, suddenly my shoulder is moving like way better than it ever did. And I was just euphoric because my brain was going like, that's the way you can do it. I forgot. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. Now, mobility can sometimes be helpful if it's working at the nervous system level in some way. If it's giving you a signal that's letting that, mm -hmm. whether it's a feedback loop um, get, get um, interrupted or a nervous system pattern that wasn't communicating properly, communicate properly, that's what's required. It's all biomechanical. I mean, this is, you know, it's all electrical in a certain way. So, so you're absolutely right. Just moving passively is probably going to do nothing. But there are movement patterns and ways of engaging with certain kinds of doing mobility in certain ways that can be helpful for, um, again, uh, getting out of a feedback loop that keeps something hypertonic or getting out of a nervous system loop where your brain doesn't realize that's what's going on because it's become uh, um, uh, habituated to it. Hmm. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm happy to let people sort of choose whatever to wear whatever footwear they want to wear. Oh, you know? even better. And, Look, um... <laughs> wait, wait, let me ask, wait, let me, hold on. Let me ask you this. How do you feel about people just walking in a barefoot shoe? Uh, yeah, great. Absolutely. Do, you, do, you, do any of the problems that we talked about, do you see that for just walking? What I 100% recommend for anyone is to do strength training or, you know, balance training, any work, any gym work in a barefoot style shoe or barefoot Agreed. if they let you do it in the gym because you're in your natural stance with nothing Agreed. else impacting your your arch or your heel rise or whatever. So that's that's my bottom line. And then it's walking on trail and then it's walking on you know, harder surfaces. Yeah. And then the last thing is running. And I think a lot of people will go, you know, straight into running because they're runners and they want to run. I know. Well, you know, A, I agree with you. And B, I would argue that this is perhaps, this is the most interesting thing for me. So I have an ebook coming out about this, but that's not why it's interesting. It just coincidental that way. Research from Dr. Isabel Sacco showed that regular runners who do an eight week foot strengthening exercise program over the course of a year, that was how long the study went, over the course of that year-long study, had 250% fewer injuries than the runners who didn't do that foot strengthening program running in regular shoes, okay? Here's where it gets mm -hmm. even more fun. Research from Dr. Sarah Ridge shows that just walking in a minimalist shoe built foot strength as much as doing basically that same exercise program. Now, mm -hmm. there isn't yet a study showing if you just walk in regular, or sorry, walk in minimalist shoes, a truly barefoot shoe, again, which is like us, Vivo Barefoot, a few others, very few. There's a lot of fake minimalist shoes or partial minimalist shoes, sold, mostly sold by the bigger companies. But anyway, there's not a study yet showing that if you just walk in a minimalist shoe and run in a regular shoe, you have 250% fewer injuries over the course of a year. But let's just do the math. Walking in a minimalist shoe builds foot strength as much as doing in the exercise program. That exercise program reduces injury risk in runners in regular shoes over the course of a year by 250%. If that makes sense, run in whatever the hell you want. 
But when you get out of those to do what you just said, to build some strength, to have better balance, to do where your workouts, etc., wear one of these and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not trying to convince everyone to run in a minimalist shoe. There's a lot of times where you want to, you know, you need something else. Um, I mean, I'm always either barefoot or in them, but, I'm, you know, again, that's me. But there is a time and a place for having strength, having awareness, having balance, having posture, like we talked about at the very top of this. And hmm. you can't get that in a shoe that insulates you from the ground, that doesn't let your foot move, that jacks up your posture, that squeezes your toes. And so, you know, that, that would sort of be my uh, thing. Whenever there's a chance to do what's good for your feet, let them move, let them feel, let them function, um, you know, do that. When you don't want to do that for whatever reason, knock yourself out. You'll still get some benefit. Look, we have a professional ice hockey player who says she's skating better than ever because she's wearing our shoes. Clearly not when she's skating, <laughs> but she says, you know, she's built doing all those things you just mentioned. She's building foot and ankle strength from being in minimal shoes when she's in the gym and walking around. And she says it's translating to how she's skating. There's someone mm -hmm. who did a, uh, wrote an ebook years ago. Called, uh, it was actually Dr. Emily Splickle. She's a surgical podiatrist and barefoot person um, called, I think it was called Catwalk Confidential. And it was all how to wear high heels. It was just a foot exercise mm -hmm. program so that you could tolerate wearing high heels. So yeah, mm -hmm. again, you, look, you and I fundamentally agree about all of this. This is a joke. So, yeah. <laughs> um, um, so it, the only, I mean, the only thing we're disagreeing is really two parts. Straw man art three, straw man argument. Let's look at the stats compared to other things. And then sort of like in closing, if you will, when you talked about mm. what you didn't experience from wearing barefoot shoes, um, I would say you may be right. And in the same way that I don't have um, uh, demonstrable evidence that my foot shape function and strength changed over the years because I didn't measure on day one and then measure mm -hmm. again over time. I don't think that you did the same. So we're both yeah. an N equals one. And it feels like something may or may not have changed, but we don't know what did or didn't happen because we just didn't study it, which is a shame. I think your major gripe is the, is the title of the video. And I, no, and no, I get no, no, that. no, no, I, no, I love the title. I actually love the title. <laughs> for these, for, no, seriously, because, because it did exactly what you thought it would which is get people into the conversation. No, my major gripe mm -hmm. is again, the industry, because for, I mean, look, I'm in the yeah. industry and I don't do the things that you were accusing the industry of doing, nor do the people that I know in the industry. And then again, yeah. the comparison, not comparing the problems that may or may not happen in a barefoot shoe out of the context of what does happen. We know what happens in a regular shoe is my second gripe. And then the third was some other thing that I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> anyway water under the bridge but uh, yeah, yeah i think these these conversations are uh, super super helpful and super useful and I i've learned so. heaps just listening to you so i'm really i'm really grateful that we got to to have this chat and i would actually love to do it again no it's a pleasure i know and thank you for being willing to do it i've invited um uh, i have on many occasions invited people onto my podcast who think i have what I call a case of cranial rectal reorientation syndrome, um, mm -hmm. otherwise known as having my head up my butt. And uh, they won't do it. You know, they just don't want to get in, into the conversation. And, and I, I, I don't know why. Um, I mean, I, I can understand why, because mostly I'll keep asking them, well, where's your proof for what you believe? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, they won't have a good answer for that. But regardless, you know, I agree with you. Conversations, and this went on for way too long, conversations like this need to happen for many, many reasons. Um, so that mm. people under, look again, so that people understand what reality is, the way you yeah. get hurt in every possible way is trying to argue with reality. Yeah. So let's try to end that. <laughs> um, once again, Chase, total, total pleasure. And, um, really looking forward to this next. We can, we can do part two. And if you like, if people um, feel the urge for that and take questions and kind of feel those or whatever shows up, I'm, I'm just yeah. being here to help.